Hello and welcome everybody. This is Jack. I'm excited to be here with you. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It's evening here in Colorado and I'm looking forward to seeing who's going to be showing up here live. But if you're also watching this after the event, thank you also for being here. I think you're going to get some value. I'm going to be taking some questions, hopefully giving some answers. And uh, I'm also going to talk a little bit about coaching because I am enrolling coaching right now. So if you've ever wanted to have my attention and support and challenge one-on-one, -on -one, now could be the time because in the next few days here, I'm enrolling for my next coaching cycle. And this is the last time I'll be enrolling in this year. So if you want to get involved, get involved. If you are here live, please say hi, hello. Let me know where you are tuning in from. If you are interested in coaching, you can go to my website, jackbutler.com forward slash apply, and you can fill in a coaching application. It doesn't take you any amount of time, really. It doesn't commit you into anything, but if we think it's a good fit, then uh, I will invite you to come on to a discovery call with me, and we'll see if this is an opportunity that is going to be good for you. Angela, hey, welcome. I'm happy to be here live. Yeah, I've decided to start a little bit earlier here the other night. The, tonight, I went live at like half past nine the other night, and uh, I'm not sure that the people on the East Coast were too appreciative of that, let alone people in Europe. So, um, hey, Claire, you're tuning in from Scarborough. Okay, so that is pretty late, right? Plus seven, that has, wow, is that, yeah, 2 a.m. There we go. Rebecca, hi. Uh, new to your channel. Okay, thanks for being here. I appreciate that. Tuning in from California. That's great. Which part of California? So let me know if you have any questions, if there's anything that you have going on at the moment that you want some input. Um, if you have any questions about coaching, I'll also take those. Um, one of the things I did want to just start by sharing is what I see as the potential power of coaching because uh, I've also received powerful coaching in my life. It's one of the things that got me into being a coach uh, about a decade ago when I was really at a sort of meltdown moment in my life. Everything that I'd put attention into seemed to be uh, dissolving in front of me, um, a time of real uncertainty and fear. Um, I actually received some, some really great coaching from a guy who was the then first uh, sort of integrally trained coach in uh, in England in this particular methodology of coaching. And one of the things that a coach can do is to help you see where your current way of being is actually wanting to be upgraded, right? In the coaching world, we talk a lot about beliefs, limiting beliefs, changing beliefs, installing new beliefs, but sort of much bigger than beliefs and attitudes is this thing that we can call way of being. And it's sort of the totality of, of who you are, what you think life is, what's important to you, what you put attention on. And that changes. Uh, or let me say that differently. For some of us, there is an opportunity in our adult life for that to change. For a lot of people, who they, who they were when they were 16, 18, 21, 25 is in many ways the same person that they are in later life. Obviously, they have more experience. Obviously, they have, you know, perhaps more um, more and varied and challenging experiences behind them. Perhaps they are better in their career, or they've started a family, or they've done lots of things in their life. But if you sort of unpick the operating system, it's somewhat the same, and that's fine. But some of you will reach moments in your life where you realize, you know what? I actually need a new operating system because who I thought I was, the way that I have been showing up, the personas, for example, that I've taken to be myself or the strategies that I've been using since childhood, now they're not working so well or I'm noticing where they're limiting my expression, my ability to love, my ability to be true to who I am and to be free. That's where coaching can be really powerful if you're working with a coach that has a more developmental perspective because they might be able to invite you into the new territory that's waiting for you but make it less scary and provide some handholding and scaffolding. Um, I like doing that. I also like helping people with really crunchy problems. I've helped people with love triangles. I've helped people with breakups. I've helped people with letting go of someone that's really not available to be in relationship. I've helped people who 
aren't really enjoying their dating and how to how to approach dating in a more fun and authentic way. Um, I've helped people resolve dynamics that they've been in with other people that they've felt to be intractable, but actually they aren't. So if you're stuck right now or you're experiencing, huh, I might be at the end of a, a way of being that's ready to be upgraded, um, or I just know there's something I want to get traction on that I haven't been able to, maybe consider coaching, whether it's with me or with someone else. Obviously, if you like my work and approach, I'd love for you to consider to work with me. And I do only have limited slots because I don't actually take on that many coaching clients when I coach because I like to give a high quality of attention. And uh, I'd love to see if that might be a good fit if you're listening and that's of interest. So jackballer.com forward slash apply. Let me jump back here. Uh, okay, Rebecca's in LA. Awesome. I hope you're having some great, of course you're having great weather. It's LA. What are we talking about? Southern California, great weather guarantee, right? Um, I hope you haven't been too impacted by wildfires. Um, I know that a lot of the Mediterranean, which has a similar climate, has been being impacted by wildfires this summer. And um, people have been talking to me here about leaf peeping, you know, going out and seeing the changing leaves. In Colorado, we have beautiful aspens. And I've like told them I'm not really in full. I'm still, I spent the summer in England and, you know, Claire and those of you, that Joe, that are in the UK, you know, this was not, I think it was the dullest summer a dullest old August since 1931 or some such. So I'm still hankering after a bit of summer. So I'm not really ready to admit that we're in fall, even though it is one of my favorite seasons. It's still summer here in uh, temperature at the moment, but we'll see how long that lasts. All right, Carrie, hi to New York. Welcome. Oh, funny, I've just been talking about leaves and here we have leaves in 2022. Good evening from central Ontario. That's cool. Talk about a women's intuition. I was literally just thinking of humans going to go into your videos. Well, there you go. I did wonder who had uh, instructed me to go live tonight. So I appreciate that. Angela says, I'm struggling with self-love in regards to where I am in life, what I should have and could have done different. How can I figure that out? Well, in some ways, the answers to that could be about faith. You know, whether you have faith in a more uh, sort of religious or spiritual or other context but there's a there's a way of orienting to your life, which is, you know, for all its trail travails and for all my mistakes, right? Because we're all going to make mistakes. We've got to have permission to make mistakes that I am actually where I'm meant to be. You know, a lot of the personal growth world, I, I think, perpetuates this idea that, you know, we need to have this very clear vision for our life and that if where we are matches up with the vision. I mean, wow, I'm actually remembering, you know, in my, my first job when I was 21 years old. Um, second job was, well, third job, if you include my brother's summer work, but I didn't enjoy that. Don't tell him. I just didn't enjoy that. Um, so I used to be involved in promoting Tony Robbins' seminars for a little while in London. And actually he would teach this. He would say, here's this formula, something like LC life conditions equals BP blueprint. So it's <laughs> funny. It's got like code, isn't it? Um, <laughs> BP happens to also be a reprehensible. No, it doesn't really, does it? I don't know. Now I'm now I'm getting into deep water horizon. Stay focused, Jack. So the point is blueprint BP equals life conditions. So my idea for my life equals how my life shows up and then I'm going to be happy. Well, I think that might be true at a certain level of development, but I think there are plenty of other levels of development where that becomes less interesting because actually rather than life happening by you, where you create everything in your life, you actually allow life to happen through you. And therefore you want to be more engaged with life as a co-participant in your life with noticing which doors are opening and closing to you. Where's the resonance? Where's the aliveness? Where is life meeting you or not? And that's not just about my little Jack idea of what Jack's life should be. That's actually, there's bigger things at play here. So it might be that you're rubbing up against a belief system that's that's pretty well installed, I would say, in, in mass culture in some ways that, yeah, you should know what your life's about. You should go get it. And then if that turns up, you'd be happy. And what you may be moving into is this more authentic orientation to your life to say, well, what is happening? What is a life for me? And actually what has happened? I want to be at peace and acceptance with that. Sometimes to, to create that peace, I need to have conversations with people. Maybe I need to say sorry or apologize or just say, Hey, I wish I'd shown up differently. That's all allowed, but I'm not, I'm not actually going to be living in the past because I'm, I'm here in the present noticing that life has guided me to this moment, even if it's been, 
hell of a path, even if I don't understand it, even if there's mystery, even if there's stuff that's beyond my understanding. So I think that's one of the ways that you get over the sort of shoulda, coulda is, yeah, there's always going to be things that we could have done differently and we will make mistakes, but no one can live a life without making mistakes. And sometimes we learn the best from our mistakes. And um, it's also just a less heavy place to live from, right? If I'm living with this constant sense that I should be somewhere else, you know, that's, that's a hard place to live from because it means I'm not in rapport with or in acceptance of where I am right now. And actually, I think there's more fulfillment sometimes in the deep acceptance of who I am than my life turned out the way I thought it was going to turn out. You know, because particularly once you get into deeper developmental territory, I think you're off script. You're off script. You're not trying to do the thing that you thought you were necessarily going to do 10 years ago. It's like there's there's more um, alignment with what's actually becoming. And it's, it's basically less mental. You know, a lot of self-development at a certain stage is people having an idealized sense of self. You know, I want to be this kind of person. And let me do that. And if I'm not that, let me punish myself. And when I am that, let me reward myself. Um, but that is an idealization. It's not reality. It's not truth. It's an idea about who you are. And often what's better than an idea about who you are is who you actually are. You know, so sometimes you have to drop those ideas of shoulda, coulda in order to see more clearly. You know, if you bring me your dog and I'm like, oh, God, I should have been a different breed. I'm not really seeing clearly the situation. It's like, no, this, this, this is a German shepherd. It's not meant to be a poodle. It's meant to be a German shepherd. As humans, we don't really know whether we're meant to be German shepherds or poodles. We have ideas about it, but we actually have to live life. I think in life, when it comes through us, it shows us more of these opportunities. So I, I think also in any work that you do on the inner critic, you know, is going to help with this as well. Because it's, it's going to, the inner critic is going to jump on this kind of idealized version of yourself. All right, let's have a look here. Please keep the questions coming if you've got them. And if you're interested in coaching, you've just joined us, you can go to jackbutler.com forward slash apply. That's where we're accepting new coaching applications for the next three days. Okay. Hi, Jack. It's nice to see you again. Just wanted to let you know that your camera is out of focus. Oh, dear. The background is sharp, but your face is blurry. Well, um, that's interesting. Is that, let me just confirm is that the experience that other people are having i wonder if i've gotten i wonder if my zealous my, my zealousness i've gotten a little bit close I'm, I'm curious does it does it change with um the distance of where i'm at if it's really bad i could i could stop and start again on uh, on my phone i'm actually here on my computer um looks fine now all right maybe i'll, I'll try and i'll try and move this way in this plane as opposed to forward and back um very romantic this time of year, my favorite time of year. That's great. I'm always surprised at how quickly people get into Halloween. As I say, I'm still kind of holding on to summer or like a sense of an Indian summer, you know, like a prolonged sort of summer into fall. Um, but people seem to be like plastering their houses with the, with the cobwebs, um, the pumpkins, all sorts of things. Here, I'm just going to rub this, see if this makes any difference here. Um, that's a shame because this actually should, you know, this is a better computer than I've done in the past. So this should be better, not worse. Um, I have no family at all, just me on my own. And I did not do anything in my life as a teenager because I wasn't allowed to do anything. Got it. Yeah. Well, you know, some sometimes our path has elements of more solitariness, you know, and sometimes there's some... Um, um, some truth to that. Not fuzzy here, but there was intermittent buffering. Oh, okay. Not the best connection. All right. Well, I'm going to hang in here for a little bit. And if uh, collectively the feedback is that this isn't working, I will shift, uh, I will shift platforms. Um, all right. I'm going to pull back over here. Let me know if uh, you've just joined us or if you have any other questions or situations that I may be able to help with. And uh, let me bring up. Yeah. All righty. I don't see any coming, coming through here. 
All right, last call then. So is there anything else that anyone's got that I can help with or talk to um, as we wrap up this session? Let me know. Thank you for being here and apologies if we've had a bit of a production uh, production issue. I had a very toxic mother. She's not here. I forgive her. Yeah, well, that's a great orientation to be in. And yeah, sounds like if I'm hearing this correctly, you've, you've kind of done some of your work and some, um, some healing around that. You know, it can take a real... Um, sort of deep level of acceptance to acknowledge the places where our parents are limited and or unhealthy or toxic and also uh, sort of see them in their humanness um, and not just see them as our parent, you know, but to see the struggles that they lived with or the things that they weren't able to do or the ways that they weren't able to open or feel safe or trust or that they were betrayed you know, so sometimes there's a uh, there's a sort of freedom in, in the both and of you know both doing the work to really look at yeah w what did this unhealthiness and what was it how did it impact me how did it shift how I've shown up and then also how can I see the person in the, in their limitation and 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 love them as this unique person in my life who birthed me and raised me for better or for worse um, yeah. Nino, hi from Australia. Talk about love triangles. <laughs> well, this is territory that I have supported people in through coaching. Uh, typically, when it comes to me, I'm talking to the person that we could say is the third, right? So there's, you know, a couple or a married couple or partners, and then there's a, something happening on the side as typically a secret affair um, and they're kind of wanting to end it, but they're, they're struggling to end it. And perhaps the guy is also promising some things that maybe one day they'll be together, or maybe he needs more time just to figure it out, or he's confused because he loves his partner, but he also loves them as his lover. Um, and, you know, I've even seen this in situations where it's, um, you know, perhaps the primary couple are sort of boyfriend and girlfriend, but they're actually heading on a track to more commitment or to having a family. And that's all happening whilst at the same time, this kind of affair is going on. And so she's really confused because she's like, well, he's actually about to marry or, you know, buy a home with or have a kid with this other person. But still over here, he's like seeing me and doesn't want to end it. And I'm really confused, you know? So I think partly it, that is an inherently confused situation and no one is really bringing clarity to it. You know, so my job is to help that person be the source of clarity and leadership. And typically it's actually helping them downshift the connection, perhaps going no contact, perhaps making some clear communications and declarations, perhaps taking a stand for their own power and boundaries and worth. And, you know, also part of my job is to be compassionate because I think most people are quite judgmental of those situations. And typically I see the person struggling. They've even tried to leave, but the guys kind of reel them back in. They don't really know who to talk to because it's an illicit situation. Um, I wouldn't really wish it on anyone. So, um, and I was just saying this, I, I did a different live earlier. Um, you know, life doesn't always present everything in, in sort of very neat package tram lined you know, bordered situations, you know, it's like, sometimes people do meet, and one of them is dating someone else, you know, or one of them is in a relationship with someone else. And actually, there's something true about this connection, where it might mean that the initial relationship reconstellates, right? It might be that in the fullness of time, actually, it makes sense for these two people to be together and not these two people, right? Sometimes, that happens. Now, for some people in a more traditional worldview, that will never or should never happen because, you know, this is it. We've made a commitment till death do us part, right? And if that's your worldview and that's your truth, that's great. 
That doesn't mean sometimes that these situations won't show up. And also for a lot of us, we're not actually in that orientation. You know, to, most of us are going to have multiple relationships during our life. That's just the reality if you look at the data. So if that's true, then we might also have to be open to the reality that sometimes these things happen. It's inconvenient. It's difficult. No one's been given the download on how to handle it. And generally, I'm trying to orient people towards simplicity, which is he's got to figure out you know, is he going to stay and recommit to his partnership or is he going to dissolve that? And then we might see if something else is possible. But there are very few guarantees in that situation. And typically, I've seen that the guy doesn't actually leave. He just, you know, he's perhaps not got much fun going on in his relationship. And, and that has created an opening to have some of that happen elsewhere. I mean, look at Esther Perel's work. She's done a lot of work on why do people have affairs. And typically it's because there's a part or a significant part of themselves or parts of themselves that they're not bringing into their relationship, either because they don't know how, or it's not welcome there, or it was welcome, but it's not now, or responsibilities have overtaken. You know, lots of things could be happening there, but that situation leaves the opening for you to then experience that with someone else who comes along and suddenly, you know, we don't have the baggage of commitments and, taking out the trash and all the day-to-dayness of relationship. Everyone wants the comfort and stability everyone wants. Most everyone wants the comfort and the stability of a known connection, but they also want the desire and mystery of the unknown. And I think Esther Perel is probably the most eloquent speaker about this. You know, it, it also, in my own studies, this is a little bit point four on the Enneagram, you know, is, is this sort of push and pull between the things that I know and like and the comfort and stability and routine of a loving relationship, but also the desire and the attraction that exists for the stuff that I don't know. And so how we live with that tension is part of being, um, you know, an adult in modern times, postmodern times. And, um, you know, when you simplify the connection to say, okay, Maybe, let's say I'm the person who's engaged in the affair. Maybe I'm realizing that this person has brought adventure into my life. Adventure is important to me, but I actually want to experience that in my relationship over here or my partnership. Okay, so this affair, in a sense, could wake me up to this reality that I haven't been living. It doesn't necessarily have to mean that this primary relationship is over. It might mean that I have to heal some betrayals. It might mean I have to um, rebuild some trust. But that might be a way of, of looking at what's actually happening. Or it may be actually the truth is there is something to be pursued in this other connection. So let's put it aside for the moment, as hard as that might be. And let's sort out what is in front of me, which is this primary relationship that I've got to decide how I'm going to let that go or what we're going to do or how we're going to co-parent or whatever. Right. These things can be complex. So I'm not, you know, I'm not making light of that. I'm just saying, well, in a sense, if your orientation is to what's true, you might get a different answer to what's dutiful or what's um, true to the commitments I've made, you know, and sometimes people are navigating those those uh, edges. What I'm a fan for is not, um, you know, not the not being in unrealness, you know, so. I might be helping the client in this instance, you know, okay, he's telling you all these things, but you know, you've heard these a year ago, two years ago, a month ago, seven months ago, nothing's changing. So actually these words are vacuous and they're the best that he can do, right? If you, it's like a, a general perspective, right? We typically, we do the best we can do with the tools, awareness and resources that we have. And so, you know, he doesn't know how to get himself out of the situation. He doesn't know what his leadership looks like in this situation. So you're going to have to provide some of your own leadership. And that probably is going to mean I'm going to say something and then I'm going to go no contact and I'm going to mean it. And when I mean it, I don't know whether he's trying to reach out to me because actually those messages don't even reach me. The other thing I was saying earlier is there can often be another level of complexity, which is you can't easily avoid him because he's your boss or he's your coworker or he's, you know, your doctor or dentist or he's coaching your kid's little league team or there's some way that he's actually going to cross paths with you. That makes it harder, right? And sometimes you have to make really tough decisions in those situations because the greater good is you uh, being able to heal and move on. So it might mean for a moment you 
move sideways in your career or you change offices or you start working from home three days a week or you blah, 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 right? You change something so that you don't have to keep reactivating this, you know, desire and this, you know, wound in a sense. Um, but I don't know if this is true. I have heard, you know, astrologers, I'm, I'm not an astrologer. I, I know enough to be dangerous, but I'm not an astrologer. Um, I've heard people say some people it's, this is sort of their pattern in their path. It's like, they don't always just meet someone who's like, Hey, I'm single and dating and you're single and dating. And do you want a relationship? So, you know, comically that might be in some people's paths and not be in others. If it's in yours, you know, how can you be grounded and sober and true to yourself and true to yourself? You know, it's, it can be so hard, right? There can be so much anguish in relating of the sort of unrequited love or the, the thing that you're so drawn to like a moth to a flame, but you actually part of you, maybe your more, you know, prefrontal cortex knows this isn't actually good for me, but yet I get drawn again, you know, like any addiction or something that has you off center. So sometimes you have to run around that loop enough to then notice actually, yeah, his words aren't coming true. Nothing is really changing here. I'm just getting burnt. I'm, I'm a moth that's just burning myself again and again. And if that's true, at some point, the pain of disconnecting becomes less than the pain of continuing to burn yourself. You know, so it's not to say it's easy, but that's, uh, that's where I'd be starting this, that situation. Um, why do we pine away for the ex-relationship that wasn't even good? <laughs> you guys are working me tonight. <laughs> ah, you might have to coach with me to really unpack that. Jackbutler.com forward slash apply. Um, I mean, it's sad at one level, right? I mean, anyone that you've been close to, even people that you've been close to that it hasn't been a good relationship or you haven't been good to one another or they haven't been good to you or it has been difficult circumstances, you know, it's sad because for most of us relationship and, you know, unless we're going to go into polyamory or some other expression like that, it's a kind of binary game, right? You're either kind of my partner or my date or you're not. And so that's a lot of loss. Um, you know, if, that's just a lot of loss. And there aren't that many situations that are exactly like that. I mean, hopefully you don't have to lose a family member in that way. I mean, maybe, you know, in the fullness of time, obviously we're all going to probably be going right. But, it, you know, sometimes you might lose, you know, an aunt or a parent or a gran, but it's like, maybe there's a little bit of like, well, you know, they're getting older. We know it's coming at some point, you know, it, it's not by choice. It's by, you know, how life has unfolded. Whereas I think romantic relationships kick up such strong early imprints of, you know, being the little one with, with our parents um, that it would almost recreate the kind of devastation as a child in, in losing a parent in that way. Um, you know, often we want what we can't have. Often we want to imagine that something might be different, right? So if only he hadn't lost his job or if only, you know, we'd had a nicer home or we'd had more support or we'd had more money or, you know, and all those things could be partially true. We don't know. There's a lot of unknown in these situations. Um, I also think there's a mechanism. I've noticed this not just around romantic relationships, even in, in terms of work, where sometimes you look back and it's, you know, it's almost like a, a cognitive distortion or a self-serving bias, you kind of remember some of the good things and some of the hard things fade, fade away a bit. So you're like, oh yeah, that, that work where we used to do that and we'd hang out in those ways and we'd have those conversations or we'd achieve that or create that, you know, but I'm sort of forgetting, yeah, but I would like go to bed on a Sunday anxious to go into the office on a Monday. You know, it's hard. I, I, yeah, I, I've been surprised in my own life where something that's been hard for so long when it eventually resolves, I almost want to be able to recreate that pain to be able to remember how hard it was. But sometimes it's like, oh no, that's kind of done. And I just can't recreate that same, and you know, maybe I wouldn't want to recreate the pain, but do you see what I mean? It's like, oh my God, that was, you know, my thumb was hurting for so long. Now it doesn't hurt, 
it's hard to remember how much it hurt, you know? So, um, yeah. Some people are able to turn ex-lovers into friends and that's the right path for them. And it's a safe relationship. It doesn't, you know, it's not got this sort of continued desire to reignite it romantically. Each person can have their partner and it's not a threat. I mean, so there's something beautiful about that, right? That you, you, you maybe lose some of the romantic love, but you don't really lose the person. Like they're still in your life. They can still find out who did they become or, you know, what was their life path. And oftentimes that's actually not available, right? So it's more like we hit a brick wall and there's no way to go forward from here. And so all we're left with are memories and nostalgia and hopefully some memories of good times. But that's also kind of rough in some ways. And maybe for a lot of um, human history, people weren't dealing with that because they didn't live so long, because they weren't likely to have multiple romantic relationships, because there was such a survival basis to romantic relationships, because there was also, you know contractual and familial patterns of marriage that weren't really to do with romantic love. So people didn't even have expectations that they would have romantic love for their spouse. That would have been an alien notion, not even that many centuries ago, or you would be in an arranged marriage. So, you know, it's sort of out of your hands or it was political, you know, it was an alliance between families or it was property, or you were basically owned because we didn't have anything approaching any kind of equality between the sexes. So, there's also lots of things that are still somewhat, somewhat recent. And then if you throw in, you know, the panoply of things that people are now opening up to in relationship, whether it's polyamory or noticing that I'm sapiosexual or demisexual or eth ethically non-monogamous, or you fill in those blanks, you know, we are, we are in virgin territory. We are in new frontiers. And so, yeah, most people are trying to make sense of that with sense-making capacities that they didn't inherit from their upbringing or culture. And for a lot of human history, you would have inherited a lot of your sense-making directly from your parents' tribe or education. And you wouldn't have had to be doing too much of your own sense-making, you know, in, in the sort of the bigger senses of sense-making. So yeah, live simply so others may simply live. I like that. I never heard that. Lindsay says, I'm struggling to move on. I know we weren't a good fit but I feel like I failed again. Well, sounds like you're being hard on yourself and you're noticing that. Um, you know, we weren't a good fit. So sometimes you can turn that over to life, right? And just kind of say, this wasn't a good fit. You know, that that almost could be, you know, genetic and epigenetic as much as anything else. Like life, if life wants to arrange a good fit, it can arrange it. And in this instance, it hasn't. And so the relationship has gone away and that that's probably therefore for the highest of both people. Now, does that mean you're not going to be feeling grief? No. Does that mean you might not have some regrets? No. There's lots of things that, you know, are kind of the human romantic side of that. Um, but uh, learning how to cultivate learnings from relating, I think that's a good thing, right? So noticing, okay, yeah, there was a way I showed up there that I would like to learn to show up differently, right? Or even in some of my own experiences, there were places that I could have been a better partner or I could have learned how to um, meet someone's needs or I could uh, be better or more courageous in my apologies or do that earlier. That's all good stuff to harvest. But if there's like a fundamental thing that this is just not really gonna work out, I think that's above our pay grade. And being hard on ourselves about that, you know, it, it's almost like taking responsibility for something that is probably not yours to take responsibility for. You know, if I wake up and it's uh, stormy weather and I take responsibility for that, that's, that's an overextension of my responsibility. So I'm saying that because there might be an over-responsible one in you. It might even be, you know, when we look at personality traits, there might be some neuroticism there, right? Even if it's just marginal or mild, where you're overly responsible, you're overly prone to guilt, uh, maybe you even take responsibility for things that other people or best take responsibility for, or there's things that you, you're almost like over-imagining your power to shape certain things. I mean, this is nuanced territory, right? Because we are incredibly powerful and we can shape things. 
but there's also ways that we need to learn actually life is in charge here and I don't need to take responsibility for everything. You know, uh, I don't know if this is true for you, but sometimes the corollary of this that I have sort of seen or hypothesized is, you know, maybe someone's worrying about something and something bad happens and they imagine that their worrying created the bad thing. Now, at one level of manifestation is possible, but it's almost like you're playing a mini God role here. This stuff is above your pay grade. You don't need to worry about it quite so much. You know, if every time someone had a negative thought, something negative happened, we'd all be screwed, right? Because even the finest mental health, you can have negative thoughts, you can have negative experiences. So sometimes it's almost like, okay, yeah, I don't need to be quite so responsible. What would it be like for me to actually turn it all over to life and say, if you want me to partner with this guy, you make it kind of happen. I'll show up, but you make it clear and you make it work. And if you can't make it work, okay, maybe it's not me. Or if there's something you want me to learn, make it clear to me and I will do my work, my coaching, my therapy, whatever it is, I'll do the work. But I'm not going to sit around in a state of being hard on myself, of feeling guilty and overly responsible, because that's not the right contract for me to be in. So you're not a failure, you're learning, and you're inviting life to show you what you need to learn. We all need to learn. We all have a curriculum, right? In a sense, we're all here to discover what that curriculum is. And no one's above and beyond that in my experience. We're all frail and vulnerable. We all screw up. We all make mistakes. We all say things we shouldn't say. We all do things we shouldn't do. We all want redos and replays at times. I think that's just part of being a human and actually just accepting that in a like, okay, yeah, I don't need to be down on myself. That's just part of the human experience. It can be really helpful. You know, you've got gold in you. You've got preciousness in you. You've got wounds in you. That's the deal. That's all of it, you know, and, and learning to notice those places that we can gently come towards our own difficult places and relax them or encourage them and be gentle to ourselves. And we might have to do that many, many more times than we think we should. That's the path in, in my experience. So and Ina says, great info, Jack. I just want to say thank you, especially for those two videos about in love with a married person. They saved me. Thanks again. Yeah, you're welcome. I'm glad you found your way there. And I'm glad they've been helpful. Yeah. Excellent. Claire says, I failed at everything in life. Okay, so this could be, in a sense, this could be similar territory to what I was just talking to, you know? Um, Let's look at it a different way. Someone in theory could fail at everything that they put their attention on and still be a success because of the way that they hold it. If my success or failure is only in the things that do or don't happen in my life, that's a very difficult place to live from. And it's a very fragile place to live from, right? Because, yeah, maybe it's all going my way and then someday it doesn't. And I have no capacity to be with that. And I only can internalize that as, as my own failing. Better, I think, is the, what they call the sort of blessings in disguise model, which is I actually try and make as few things in my life good or bad. They are just things in my life. And sometimes it goes my way and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it doesn't go my way for years. Maybe even for most of this lifetime, it doesn't go my way. But perhaps the practice is actually... Um, cultivating my acceptance of what is and what isn't in my life rather than overlaying it with a lot of secondary commentary about what's good and what's bad and whether I'm good or I'm bad. It's almost like we can, we can start to transcend and that conversation um, and be in a different perspective. Uh, now, if I'm not owning my own ability to take responsibility for my life, um, that might look a bit different. But, you know, I think we have a cultural bias. I think we sort of, you know, in some ways this is the success of modernity, you know, the modern world that, you know, most of us have an expectation that we might live a somewhat long, somewhat healthy life, and may that be so. But we also, I think, assume that we should be happy. And I don't know if that's actually the measure of a life or if that's in everyone's uh, divine path. You know, sometimes what you learn in life, I mean, certainly this is true in development. Most people don't develop because they're happy. Most people develop because they're in pain. You know, 
yes, we can sometimes be inspired to do something and, you know, it pulls us forward. But for a lot of us, we don't change things until the pain suggests that we actually need to change something, you know? Um, you know, pain can be a great teacher. It can be a hard teacher. You know, I know that from my own experiences of chronic pain, it can, it can be rough, but it can also be, you know, beautiful and, and teach you how to be present and be grateful and abide and, and look, look for the small blessings. Um, you know, when I've had times where my spine has been so locked up that I, I'm, I'm actually struggling to move, you know, in those moments, God, what would I give just to be able to walk somewhat normally, let alone run, let alone, you know, have an amazing physical capacity to do, you know, acrobatics or whatever it is, you know? Um, so uh, part of fully individuating in life, I think, I think is actually just claiming your life and your life is going to look different than other people's. It's going to have struggles that maybe others can or can't relate to. It's, it's going to be a beautiful constellation of a lot of muck in a certain way, right? It's going to be pain and struggle and maybe beauty and maybe all these things, but we don't want to get too hypnotized to, to only seeing, you know, one part of it, but there can be a lot of beauty in pain and in struggle. And I don't think we talk about that enough. And I think because we have such strong cultural narratives about what success is, I mean, even if you break that down, for a lot of people to be successful, it means they've got to do something by definition that other people can't, otherwise they wouldn't really call it success, you know? So I don't even think that way of looking at reality is where we're going. Let's put it that way. I think we're moving more into a reality where your success is actually very much more on your own terms of what this life actually is for you, who you really are, what your signature flavor and strengths and gifts and liabilities really are, and much less templated or societally defined. Um, or just that we're not going to do school where in order for people to get A's, we need some people to get C's and E's and F's. I think we're, we're kind of moving beyond that construct. I think it's helpful in some ways, but I think we're moving beyond it. COVID highlighted the cracks. We were long distance. We drifted apart. Yes. You know, that, you know, yeah, I even know from my personal experiences that that's, it's difficult when something like COVID highlights that, but it also can be a kind of blessing in another way, because if your relationship doesn't have the load bearing capacity for tough times, then maybe there's some other constellation that might, you know, so perhaps it's an accelerant and it, and it is difficult because it perhaps ripped relationships apart that, once are ready to be ripped apart or we didn't notice on the way in. But I also think as we are evolving faster and faster, that some of that may actually have been uh, in our favor as hard as it has been. Um, three reasons to live, 15 reasons not to live. Um, I'm not quite sure what you mean by that. Are you asking me to come up with those reasons or are you sharing some reasons? Um, I recall Esther Perel saying her failures made her the best she could be. Yeah, I love that perspective. I really love that perspective. Um, you know, and I would say I could relate to that. You know, the, the privilege that I had in the first part of my life, you know, maybe before uh, leaving formal education was that there was a lot of stuff that came somewhat easily to me. Like I was a good student and I liked, I liked studying. Um, I did have an undiagnosed gluten sensitivity, which had me fall asleep in a lot of lectures, which is slightly embarrassing. And I have some of those, well, I, I eventually got rid of them, but I used for a long time, I used to keep those notes and it would be like, oh, very perfectly manicured notes. And then about halfway into the lecture, it'd start to become a little uh, un undecipherable, but still, a little, you know, somewhat like English, you know, Roman alphabet. And then eventually it would just be like strange hieroglyphics as I'm kind of like in and out of consciousness. So that aside, uh, you know, I was a good student, so I enjoyed school, I enjoyed college and uh, I was sporty. So I got opportunities through sport and to like captain sports teams. And most of the stuff that was asked of me, I could do reasonably well. Now I would say I've learned a lot more in my adult life from things that I haven't been able to do well or where it's been really hard or where I've struggled. Um, that might be less obvious to other people, but to me in terms of like deeper character formation um, and trust and presence and becoming 
who you're sort of meant to be, I think it's been a lot more meaningful, you know? So blessings in disguise. Um, until we lose a privilege, we never realize how much we took it for granted. Surgical post-op lesson 101. Yes, I'm sure that's true in ways I do and also don't understand in the sense, I'm sure there might be things like that, that, you know, age will, uh, will point out. But yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah, do you, do you remember Laz Berman? Um, what was it, Baz Luhrmann? Baz Luhrmann, the uh, ladies and gentlemen of the class of 99, wear sunscreen, right? So in that, he talks about, uh, you know, that your body will be one of your greatest gifts. And we spend so much time in this kind of body image, right? Whether it's like, well, is this beautiful enough? Or do I like the way this looks? Or is this too big? Or is this too small? Or blah, blah, blah. And actually just the pure gift of whatever your body can do right now, even if you are in pain, even if you are uh, suffering from frailties, illness, disabilities, you name it, there's still something miraculous and beautiful about whatever it is that you can do that you probably don't want to take for granted. And um, I know for me, as someone who was really sporty and who's had chronic injury, uh, you know, I can look at people who, you know, even like the Olympics, but even not the level of Olympics, just if I'm going to a park and I see people jumping around, I'm like, wow, it's so amazing that they can do that and they're not in pain, you know? Um, they probably don't have that appreciation of it. Um, but then there's other times where I've actually been bedridden and, uh, you know, like if I've got such chronic sinusitis that it's really hard for me to do anything but want to lie down and close the curtains and kind of shut the world out. And in those moments, I'm like, oh, God, why am I worried about jumping around? Like just literally to be able to walk and go outside and to, you know, move of my own volition um, would be amazing right now. So, yeah, different different layers and levels. Um, if you have just joined us, thank you for being here. I'm going to be wrapping up soon. If you have a question or a comment, get it in now because we are going to be drawing to a close. And as you can see across the bottom of the screen here, if you are interested in applying for coaching, I have a few slots that I'm opening up. These will be the last slots until at least 2022 or beyond. You can go to jackbutler.com forward slash apply. If you fill in that coping app, I keep saying coping application. Maybe, maybe this is, maybe I'm going to coach you to cope more with your life. But if you want to fill in the coaching application, then uh, we will review it. And if it seems like a good fit, we will get you on a call and uh, talk you through coaching and see, see if you want to take it forward. So don't hesitate. It doesn't cost you anything to apply and uh, could be a transformational relationship for you. So I'd love to be that person if it's the right opportunity. Um, what wisdom do you have for older people still hoping for a love match? Yeah, well, I have a perspective. I'm not saying this is absolutely true, but I have lots of evidence that it is true in lots of instances for lots of people which is that if you have an authentic desire that keeps being there over a long period of time, that it is therefore an authentic desire. And that, you know, life will in many ways try to meet our authentic desires. It doesn't always happen. But, you know, if we sort of stay true to what's in our heart to try to bring into this reality, over time, it might sometimes take way longer than we want or think. And then we might have to look at ourselves. We might have to clean our own mirrors. We might have to do some work on ourselves. But quite often, authentic desires, you know, I think of that as that's not even of your choosing, right? Without getting too metaphysical, do you decide what you desire? You know, I think it's more a priori than our own kind of conscious volition. As in life, God, something has implanted in your heart a desire for something. And if it's true that life has put that there, then maybe life will have some ways of uh, meeting it, you know? Um, what isn't helpful is to try and manipulate or control life into an outcome that we want, right? So sometimes we have to rub up against our own trust that something might still be possible. And I also have some views about hope. Um, I think a lot of what people call hope is a proxy for not trusting more deeply. Now, hope's powerful. I get that. But there's almost like a personality version of hope 
and a more essence-based version of hope. You know, the personality version of hope can sometimes be a little bit more like peaks and valleys, right? I hope this is going to happen, then it doesn't, I get disappointed. I hope this is going to happen, it doesn't, I get disappointed. And then there's this like quieter version of hope, which is like a deep knowing that life is evolving in certain ways. That's what they call, even in the Enneagram work, they call that holy hope. It's like, an, it's like noticing like, okay, life is evolving. I may or may not get everything I want. I may or may not be able to achieve the things I want in this lifetime. I may have frustrations that I never fully relax and, and have them show differently. But I sort of notice, like I am growing and life is evolving and we are getting more accepting as a species. We are actually maturing as a species. It may not be obvious right now in the polarization of culture wars. It may not be obvious because you look and you think, wow, the environment's getting so degraded. But you also have to look and say the number of people that notice and care about that, even if we haven't got effective collective action, that number grows. Like we are becoming more conscious. There aren't many people, particularly I think in the generations you know, younger than, than, than me and us, that don't get that this environment thing is like a real thing. Of course, there are some people, but in gross numbers, it's like this is really on. So who knows how we solve that? But I take hope in that just noticing, okay, yeah, more and more people join the conversation. More and more people get human rights. More and more people think women's rights are a real thing. More and more people notice that children should have a right to see their fifth birthday and not die of highly preventable disease. More and more people get it. And we've, you know, we're young. We're probably teenagers, right? As a species, we've got a long way to go. But more and more people get more and more things. You know, I remember coming across attachment. I probably came across attachment meaningfully. I mean, I came across attachment in 2001 in, uh, in psychology undergrad, but that was all about adult child, right? Adult, adult attachment. I didn't hear about that really meaningfully until maybe 13, 14, you know, now I, it's hard to find someone that hasn't heard about it. And I'm like, wow, you know, these early 20 somethings, they're all into this, you know? So we, you know, we're growing and, and you know what, it's not all about me in the sense I might tap out the limits of my growth. Who knows? Maybe, I, maybe I've reached it this year. Maybe I'll reach it next year. Maybe I'll reach it 50 years from now. Maybe I'll live to be 140 with life extension. I don't know. But if I put myself aside and go a bit transpersonal, it's like what's happening at large in the culture um, is more important, actually, than what's happening in my own life. And that's not to say it's easy to live in that perspective every moment. But I think at my best, I kind of get that, right? It's like, yeah, sometimes parents know those capacities, you know, maybe you're an immigrant family and you know that you're never really going to pick up the, the native language and then you, your kids can just pick it up in a different way, right? That it's like the next generation. The, so sometimes things happen through us, you know, you might be struggling, but your struggle may get resolved in a, in a, in a different moment, in a different generation, maybe in a direct descendant, maybe not, but that, it kind of sometimes helps you hold things a little easier when it doesn't have to be all um, also personal, actually. Um, okay. Thanks, Jack. You're great. You've helped me so much. Well, you're welcome. That's beautiful. Oh, thanks. 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 I'm glad that was, uh, that was resonating. Um, Meredith, any thoughts on wanting connection after bereavement two years on and pulling away? Got it. So I, th I think you're saying you had a bereavement probably from a primary relationship and now you're coming into a new connection and you kind of want it, but you're also pulling away. Am I getting that right? Um, seems pretty natural to me, right? I mean, uh, at one level, you're probably having the experience that, you know, what, what's dependable, right? Because this thing that I had or this person I loved has, has, is no longer here. And particularly the little one in you is going to want to know, well, don't do that again. You know, don't, don't depend on someone or fall in love so that if they go away, it's a problem. And, um, you know, that is the challenge and mystery of love in some ways, right? Is that um, we don't get to determine how long it lasts 
necessarily or you know what the what the path is that that it's almost like that's that's how we get to trust is we get to trust because there aren't guarantees right and we might want guarantees and maybe in your instance some of the guarantees are like yeah let time be your friend take it slow um, it's okay you have permission to want to pull away do your best to communicate about what's going on for you do your best to not make the other person wrong do your best to not make you wrong right so you're noticing you want to pull away i mean it might be subtle or gross but in the full spectrum of pulling away we all do it right everyone needs to pull away in moments right and particularly as men this seems to be a, a a true thing at times you know the intense the intensity of the connection is too much or we just need to have our own space i even i even read some notes from a previous reading i had where it said that i might have claustrophobic personality disorder i don't even know i haven't even looked is that a real thing i don't know but what i do know is at times i need to be alone and that i do my best recharging on my own and i didn't know that and maybe it wasn't even true growing up you know i grew up in a small house you know bunk beds with my brother four children, two adults, small house, not a lot of space, never on my own. Now I want to spend most of my time on my own. You know, I don't know if that's evolution or devolution. I'll let you decide. Um, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm saying that, that um, everyone has a right to pull away because sometimes you need to refocus over here, you need to center over here, or you just get afraid. So you have a right to be afraid. At our best, we don't transmute our fear into a conflict or an argument. I mean, I sometimes do this. Maybe you've done it. But like at our best, it, you know, if we can own like I'm feeling insecure or I'm needing space or I'm wanting to pull away or maybe I don't actually want to pull away, but the fearful part of me wants to pull away. Right. Maybe you can even get it down to that um, that level as well. So you know, we don't want you to make yourself wrong for something that might be necessary. You might need to take baby steps and maybe the right guy in connection with you right now, whether he's going to be around for a little time or a long time, maybe he's just going to have to know that, yeah, the part of reality of dating you right now is, you know, you're a little bit flighty or sometimes you need to pull away and you can't even articulate it very well. But if you in moments where you don't need to do that could articulate it, maybe that's enough for him. Um, I mean, even outside the context of bereavement, at our best as men, I think we know that, uh, particularly if we relate with women, you know, there's going to be opening and closing that's happening over there. There's going to be more trusting and less trusting. And sometimes it will be a mystery. Maybe even most of the time it will be a mystery to us. What is determining your level of trust in our connection or in me or in you or in this moment? Maybe it's a mystery to you as well, and maybe that's okay. Maybe you don't know why in certain moments you want to pull away and in others you, you don't. Maybe you can just put the possibility out there to him that that's part of the terrain right now. And, you know, he can take it or leave it in some ways, right? If that really doesn't work for him, then maybe it's not right for him to be in connection with you right now. But I'm sure there's someone for whom that would be absolutely fine, and they get it. And at our best, as men, we don't demand that you open to us or trust us. Um, we show up in an open and trustworthy way. Now, it's not always easy to do. Don't always do that myself. But at my best, that's what I would take a stand for. And probably that's true of most guys as well. So, yeah, take it slow. And, uh, you know, sometimes you need to have the connection after the connection, right? Maybe this is going to go for a while. Maybe, maybe it's not. Maybe it's also just baby steps for you. Maybe in your coming up, uh, you know, coming through a bereavement, maybe it's okay for you to be, you know, 80, 20 in this, which is 80%. You're going to, you're going to focus on yourself and what you need in your own healing. Maybe you are in a more vulnerable, fragile situation right now than he is. And that's just what it is. And, you know, he can get with that program or not. And you can do your best to explain that program, you know. So I hope that's helpful. 
Yeah, sounds like Claire's saying that's for her too. All right, guys, we are at the hour. I'm going to love you and leave you. Thanks for being here. Thank you for your questions. Um, thanks for your comments. Thank you for the positive tone and engagement. I super appreciate it. It's fun being here with you. Um, again, if you want to consider coaching, that's the URL. Go get it. And uh, I'll look forward to connecting with you soon in whatever way that is. All right. Take care now. Bye.